Well, good morning, and I hope you are having a good start to the day. Um, today was advisory, so hopefully uh, you've uh, jumped in and done a little bit of your digital citizenship lesson for the day as well. All right, and so uh, today our agenda, kind of very short, and so uh, we'll just uh, jump right into it. And so um, with that, I uh, want to continue with uh, the assignment that I introduced yesterday, which is uh, the Great Depression, uh, the impact of the Great Depression here. And uh, it's a summative piece. And so yesterday took a moment to highlight just a little bit about how maybe African Americans were affected by the Great Depression and maybe the New Deal legislation not going far enough. Today, I want to focus on um, uh, the Teenix and uh, their experience in uh, the Great Depression as well. And so one thing that perhaps maybe that you have um, noticed as you are working on this assignment is that uh, perhaps maybe early on in the, the Great Depression, uh, you have, um, when it comes to jobs, uh, some of the groups that are first uh, let go uh, might be uh, women and uh, minorities. And uh, then those jobs uh, either become available, uh, become available to um, males, white males, to, uh, to have. And so what I have here is a video clip here that's going to highlight um, Latinx experience. It's going to bring us to the Southwest or bring us all the way out to California. And it's going to focus on an experience of a particular family. And then, uh, you know, we can think about that experience of that family and in terms of then uh, being replicated in, in some regards by other families in California and then uh, a part of uh, the United States. All right, so let's focus on that. So let me get the, the video clip going. And then like always, um, when we watch video clips, I'm always curious about uh, any type of takeaways. about those takes. Young Mexicans began to build families and moved east, across the Los Angeles River, to Brooklyn Heights, Belvedere, and Boyle Heights, a diverse community in the mountains of East LA. It was there that Natividad Castañeda, a stonemason who had emigrated from Mexico in 1915, settled with his wife, Gregoria, and their two children, Francisco and his younger sister, Emilia, born in Los Angeles in 1926. It was a happy life that I had when I was a little girl. I used to like to go to school. We used to have some time to play before school started, before we went to do our Pledge of Allegiance. We went to the movies here and there. It used to be a nickel to go to the movies. We used to have a Victrola. I remember one of the records that they used to play. It was a song about Soy Virgencita, Entre las Flores Me Encontrarás. We had a nice summer porch. We had an avocado in the back. My mother used to love avocados. Maybe my dad planted the avocado for her.
closing time, the close of an era. In the 1920s, the great American word was prosperity. Now the 30s have begun and there is a new word, depression. As the depression deepened, competition for scarce jobs grew fierce. In laundries, factories, construction companies, Mexican workers were replaced by U.S. citizens. Devastating is a good adjective to use for Mexicans in Los Angeles and the Depression. Very quickly, by 1931, you know, half the population is unemployed, much larger than the general Los Angeles population. That means a lot of the people that had had fairly secure employment before this period now are out of work. My father lost a job. He didn't want to receive relief. He didn't want to receive it. He wanted to work. But like I said, there was no work for Mexicans. At least my mother was working as a maid in a wealthy family. President Hoover, by 1931, is desperate to stay in office. He is roundly blamed for the Depression. And he begins to look for scapegoats. And it's his Secretary of Labor who begins to say, well, you know, if we simply got rid of Mexicans, we would have jobs for everyone else. Los Angeles begins to target the Mexican community. The first ever immigration raid is done at the plaza. Immigration authorities are brought in from other places to kind of surround the plaza. They end up capturing as many Japanese or Chinese Americans at the plaza, and they do Mexicans. Um, and they deport 15 people that day. But what they wanted to do is scare people, and they accomplished that. In the weeks following that immigration raid, people were scared to go to work. They were scared to, to go outside. This created a great panic not only among the Mexican community, but also among their employers. In Los Angeles, the Mexican consul suggested that instead of persecuting Mexicans, the city buy train tickets for anyone willing to return to Mexico, now peaceful a decade after the end of the revolution. Initially, in 1931, when they start this, they have no problem filling the trains. There are plenty of people who are unemployed, who want to go back. By 32, they have trouble filling the trains, and that's when more coercive measures start to be used. County welfare officials begin to target certain neighborhoods, neighborhoods that they know have a large number of unemployed Mexicans. They will go house to house. They will say, the cheese that you're getting, the bread we have been giving you, is no longer going to be made available to you. Instead, we will give you this one ticket, and this is for a ride back to Mexico on a train. This is your only choice. You will get no more assistance. For the Castañeras, the knock on the door came early in 1935, not long after tragedy struck the family. My mother got sick with TB. She died. She died in 1934. The 10th of May. I was making my first communion that day when my, when my mother died. I remember when they buried her. I remember that they had her drag me out of there because I was so emotional what was happening to her, what was happening to us. Natividad Castañeda was offered three tickets for himself and his two American-born children on a train going to Durango in northern Mexico. We had a trunk, a big trunk, and the first thing that he put in there was his working tools. That's what went in there, and, and a couple of blankets that we had, a few cooking utensils and dishes, and what little clothing we had. Because we lost everything. We arrived at the train station that was very crowded. People crying, children and adults. I was approached by a man. He says that I could stay here, but I would become a ward of the state. You know, like you hear about these orphanages, 
I, I didn't want to be in an orphanage. I wanted to be with my father and my brother. I had a family. Between three and 500,000 Mexicans and Mexican Americans are forced out of the United States in the 1930s. There are plenty of Americans who said, we don't want the European immigrants anymore. There are plenty of Americans who said, we don't want any Italians, we don't want any Poles, we don't want any Jews. But there was never an action to round them up en masse uh, and to send them back to their home countries. And this is what happened to Mexicans. We went to live with this tia, my father's aunt. We really weren't welcome because, you know, there wasn't much room even for them. So we had to live outdoors, sleep outdoors. Pouring rain. There was no place for us to go but put up with the rain. There was no running water. We had to go miles to go wash clothes. My dad used to go to work. He taught my brother the trade. And I told him that I was leaving school, that I, I would be with him. I didn't have time to be playing here and there. I had to work. Clearly, it sets up a pattern of wanting Mexican labor at times in which employment is needed and wanting people to just leave and go somewhere else when that labor is no longer needed. To be marked as visibly Mexican in America in the 1930s is to put you and your family at risk. And so Mexicans become, in LA in the 1930s, what one historian has called the invisible minority. In other words, they withdraw from public life. It doesn't mean that their culture disappears, but it means that a community that had been so expansive and overflowing retreats into a kind of shell. Emilia Castaneda returned home to Boyle Heights in 1944 after nine years in Mexico. She was 17. The first thing she did was to brush up on her English at the very school she'd attended up to the fourth grade. Once when I was coming back from school, uh, one of the neighbors asked me if I was Emilia. And I said, yes. And she says, I'm Maura. And she invited me to my home the home that had been ours. Amelia had lost it all, her home, her childhood, her family. Her father, Natividad Castaneda, could never again return to the United States. They stamped on his papers that he was deported. Every year I used to go visit him. I didn't forget him. All right, there we go. A little happy story here on this Tuesday before we go to winter break here. Um, I'm curious, as always. Um, are there any any takeaways here um, in regards to this video clip that that I had just shown? Okay, I see some some good. Um, Responses being put in the chat. And so uh, I think those are those are valid uh, points that are being brought up here uh, in regards to um, immigration and in terms of uh, looking at immigration maybe in an economic sense and uh, when the times are good, uh, encouragement for that labor pool and when times get bad uh, we see that pool getting restricted and in the case of um, Mexican Americans the Latinx uh, community uh, there were some examples of deportation and so if we put this in a greater context um, immigration in the United States in the front end of the 20th century is a very uh, 
difficult uh, policy for, for the United States in that a very restrictive and uh, only identifying certain groups really being encouraged to come to the United States. Um, we have things like quota systems, uh, percentages, uh, areas being designated as uh, desired. Um, when I think of, in a, you know, um, my mother's side of the family, uh, her grandparents have still not become um, citizens of, of the country. They're considered aliens and um, they are uh, German uh, in descent. Um, that will come into play, though, in the next decade in the Second World War. Uh, they will quickly get their citizenship papers um, at that moment uh, because they, they are realizing that, uh, one, in the 1940s, we're going to be at war against uh, Germany. Uh, two, uh, there are um, relocation camps being set up uh, for German Americans and aliens, as well as Italian Americans and aliens, but then also the Japanese Americans and aliens as well with internment camps. So when we get to immigration, I think if we look at uh, another kind of takeaway here about immigration, uh, immigration is always a very contentious issue for, for this country then as well as now. Um, here in Minnesota, so if I can bring a local angle to it during this time period, um, if there is somewhere in, in the Twin Cities metropolitan area, all right, so we're looking at the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, where do we find really the heart of um, Mexican-Americans or the Latinx community in the Twin Cities? Where can we find that location? So I'm looking at a, a geography play, a geographic feature or place. Does anyone know? Either on mic or put in the chat. So I can give an example. If, um, if I was uh, someone of German descent, which I am, um, also indigenous descent as well, uh, German descent, I knew I could go to uh, the central part of St. Paul or central uh, uh, region of St. Paul, and that's where I'm going to find uh, the Germans living in, in St. Paul. So where could we find um, a large population, perhaps, or a, a density of, of Mexican-Americans, Latinx living in the Twin Cities? Then, as well as now. All right, well, I'm hoping you're at home kind of scratching your head. It's like, well, I don't know where Mr. Newcomb's getting it. All right, there we go. There we go. I see it. Winner, winner. Way to go. Uh, St. Paul, and we're looking at uh, West St. Paul or, or the west side of St. Paul. Um, which is always interesting when uh, South St. Paul, when, you, when you're looking at um, how you you have these names, you got North St. Paul, West St. Paul, South St. Paul. You don't really have an East St. Paul, but we have an East side. But um, the South St. Paul or the West side of St. Paul. So today we'll call it Cesar Chavez uh, Boulevard or Concord Boulevard, um, Robert Street, that particular area. Um, Our Lady of Guadalupe. Uh, that part, and um, and it's being developed really at the the beginning of the 20th century, 1920s. You're starting to see um, uh, people of Mexican descent moving into that region. Could be because of the Mexican Revolution, um, but the desire for jobs. And in South Saint Paul, you have the meatpacking plant uh, plants, and so in the 1930s. All right. So long about way bringing this back here. What you saw going on in L.A. in that little video clip also occurred in Minnesota, um, about 350 to about 400 Mexican-Americans, um, as well as um, Mexican citizens uh, who we'll call aliens. But a good chunk of them are Mexican-American 
are at, are going to be deported and freeing up those jobs for um, perhaps um, people that are not Mexican American in descent. Um, and so uh, we here in Minnesota, we had that experience taking place as well. So um, we're going to see as you you're looking at this activity. And so I'll bring it I'll bring it full circle here and bring us to this activity. Um, you're looking at the the impact and um, hopefully you're finding some positives because past couple of days I brought in some some gloomy stuff. Hopefully we can find some some positives here. I will say for indigenous people, um, there is a piece of legislation that's going to be passed. The Indian Reorganization Act or the IRA is passed here. And that is that in some ways is can be have a positive spin. So if you do an indigenous people, there you go. There's your hint there. Uh, it allows uh, Indian reservations and communities to once again, bring back their, their tribal government and create a government uh, and have a little bit uh, autonomy on um, the reservations here. So <clears throat> you have that piece. All right. Um, are there, so with that, looking at this impact activity, remember uh, you can work with a historical buddy uh, to uh, do uh, January 6th. Uh, so that's a Wednesday. This is a summative piece, so it's, it's very important that you do this. Um, you do have winter break to work on it, um, but we'll have some days after winter break as well to, to complete it. Uh, so if you are working with a historical buddy, make sure you are social distancing, being very, 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 very safe in that regards. Okay. Um, so uh, I do have a question for you. Um, as uh, we are going to wrap up class here in a moment, um, perhaps maybe uh, before we, we check out here, uh, share some winter plans here. I know my family, we, we typically like to maybe sneak out of town here and not go south, but go north. Um, but we look like we're, we'll have some uh, potential day trips planned uh, as long as it works with uh, uh, my kids' uh, work schedule and, and school schedules as well here. Maybe go check out the uh, eagles in the Wabasha area, sneak up to the North Shore and take a look at some of those falls as well. Day trips, though. So anyone have some big uh, winter plans they would like to share? So we on some positive notes here. Absolutely. Ice hockey. Got to do it. Shopping. Stimulate the economy. Absolutely. Chill and hang out. Of course, we have to reconnect and we got to re-energize as well. Uh, my family claims I don't know how to chill and relax and all that stuff that I'm always on the go, go, go. All that stuff. All right. Shopping as well. Um, so hopefully, hopefully we definitely will. Uh, again, take some time for yourself. Take some time. Be with your family. Uh Take some time, of course, to um, do those things that that make you feel feel good. That's always that's always important. So, with that, um, I hope you have a great winter break, and um, see you in January.